Hey everybody, welcome back to the Revelation Bible Study. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And we're going through the book of Revelation. We're still in chapter three. We haven't gone that far. Every single one of these lessons is really short, just a couple of minutes. You're more than welcome to go back and revisit the other ones and you can read uh, these in order or you can just start right here with us or bounce around. Uh, it's really organic, it's up to you, uh, but we're glad to have you. So we're gonna continue. Uh, we're looking at a new church. This is the Church of Philadelphia. And like I said, we're in Revelation chapter three. We're gonna start at verse seven. It says, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens, I know your works. And behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. This is such a refreshing take because uh, this is good things, right? And we're kind of used to some of these bad letters to some of the churches, uh, like we've seen in the, in the past couple weeks. But the big twist here at the end is Jesus says all good things to this church. And, you know, again, we're going to have a, a similar letter writing format. This is to the church in Philadelphia. This is from Jesus, right? Philadelphia is a, a little small town in the province of Lydia. And some of you probably already know the answer to this, but uh, Philo Idelphus, right? Philadelphia means the city of brotherly love, right? And the Roman ruler, Attalus II, named it such because uh, he was so devoted to his own brother. So maybe not surprisingly, at the time of this letter, the majority of the city is not Christian. And a lot of people that were in the town were actually Jewish, uh, not necessarily by faith, but at least by nationality. And they would mock the Christians, make fun of them, which was ironic because even they weren't necessarily practicing Jews, which is why Jesus begins this way. He starts by saying, I am the true one. I am the true one. He says, I hold the keys of David. Jesus is speaking to Christians who are being picked on by Jewish people, Jewish people who are telling them that they are not true believers. And Jesus says, I'm, I'm more Jewish than your critics. <laughs> he says, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will opens. What does that mean? Well, a door opening would be a door that's welcoming, right? Closed in your face would be unwelcoming. Jesus says, I called you, I saved you. And if I open the door, he says, if I save you, in other words, he says, nobody can close that door. In other words, he says, if I, if I say you're in, then nobody else can say that you're out. Nobody's allowed to close or open the door but me. And Jesus is talking about heaven. He's talking about rescue. He's talking about salvation. He's saying, hey, don't listen to those people. Don't listen to your critics. Don't listen to the people who say, they're right or they're right or who's in or who's out. He says, you know what? The door is mine and I'm the only one that gets to open it or close it. Verse eight, he says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power and you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. Jesus says, I see you. I know you're not big. I know you're not popular. You have very little influence, but he says, I see you and I know that you're faithful. This church in Philadelphia knew that they had little power, knew that they had little influence, but they trusted and loved God. They trusted and loved Jesus. How do I know that? Verse eight, he says, I know you have little power, but you have kept my word and have not denied my name. So they showed their love for Jesus because they didn't deny him even when they were persecuted and it wasn't easy during those times, just like we've seen, it hasn't been easy for any of these churches, but they remain true. Verse nine, he says, behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie, behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I loved you. What a powerful thing to say. 
Jesus calls out those Jews in Philadelphia and he says that they're members of the synagogue of Satan. And he says, they say they're Jews, but they lie. Jesus says, you know, they're picking on you, they're calling you names, they're belittling you and making you feel less than uh, valued. He says, you know, one day, one day I'm going to grab them and I'm going to drag them back to you and I'm going to make them kneel at your feet and then they're going to see with their own eyes all that time that I loved you, that I saved you, and that you were actually right and not them. That's a powerful promise. Who would know more about who was chosen and who was right than God? A true Jew believes in Jesus because the Jewish Bible points to Jesus. Jesus was Jewish. He says, don't let people tell you that I don't love you. One day, I'm going to make them listen. He says, one day they'll know. You know what this passage reminds me? I don't need to defend my actions. I don't need to get into arguments or debates about who is right and who is wrong. When I am accused, when I am put down, when I am accosted or belittled, God doesn't need me to defend him. God is perfectly capable of defending himself. Thanks everybody for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.